Hi, Karen. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Great. So I see folks are just starting to roll in, but we're st uh, still five minutes away from start. Oh yeah, that is perfect. No problem. <sighs> so let me uh, do this. I hear a dog. Of course, there's one in every conference, right? Right, right, right. I wish I could easily get rid of that side panel without having to go into that mode. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Great. So did you have a nice evening? I did. I'm just trying to shake this. I got sick. What is it? Uh, last. Was it last weekend? I don't even remember now. It seems like a long time, but I'm just trying to shake the, you know, when you breathe in deep and you get a little tickle in your yeah. throat that's making you cough. That's mm -hmm. the last little bit I need to shake. Oh, good. Well, hopefully you'll get over that pretty soon. Yeah. So I see a couple people have joined. Hey, everybody, we're just going to there's about three minutes until we get rolling here, so just hang tight.
maybe just before we begin, can everybody um, hear me? Do you want to just put like a, you know, a one or a say hi in the comments just to make sure that you guys can hear us okay? Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. We'll give it one more minute and then we'll get going here. Okay, Karen, do you want to get going? Yeah, okay. that would be great. Let's do All it, right. Carrie. All right, perfect. Let me, I'll just kick it off real quick here. So, hey, everyone, welcome. My name is Carrie, and thanks for coming. Um, you know, for myself, I, I am a personal growth addict, and, you know, I like to say that I am engaged in a perpetual search for knowledge. I love to learn, but, you know, there's so much out there to learn. And so I have to try to rank things in terms of what value will any learned knowledge or skill provide me with respect to obviously the time and the effort needed to learn that skill. And you know, the more I dig into it, storytelling is something that continues to move up that value chain for me. So, so I've put myself on the path to up my game and add this skill to my talent stack. Cause, cause again, I think it's one of those things I call it one of those secret skills that no one tells you about, but can have huge, huge benefits for, for you personally and professionally. And, um, you know, if there's anything that my wife has taught me, it's that, you know, it never hurts to ask. And, you know, I stumbled upon Karen on a podcast. I forget exactly which one it was, but, you know, I just, I, I just, it, she compelled me enough to reach out to her. We made a little bit of a connection and, you know, I just, I just asked if, um, if she would be willing to put on a, a webinar for, for folks in my network. And I'm always looking for ways to help people. And, and, and she said yes. And so that it, it's uh, so honored and grateful to have her share some of her expertise with us. Um, and thank you, Karen, for, for doing this. And so for, for all of you guys, um, like I said, I think it's a valuable skill that we all should learn to up our games. And if you have any questions during the time, I think Karen's got about 30, 30 35 minutes of material. But if you have any questions, there's a little button on the bottom. If you want to just hit the, that Q&A button, those will queue up and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see them. We will see them. And then Karen will have time. She set some time at the end to answer those. All in. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, I'll hand it over to Karen to, to allow her to do a, you know, a better introduction of herself. But again, thank you for, for doing this and thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Carrie. It's always a pleasure. And doing data storytelling and digging into what that is and how to do it is a passion of mine. So that's what we're going to tackle today because everybody wants to know how do you tell the data storytelling? How do you tell the data story? Excuse me. Uh, because what they ultimately want is impact and influence. So that's what we're going to tackle today. And let's look at the agenda pretty quick. And there we go. I'll talk a little bit about myself. I'm the best-selling author of Business Storytelling for Dummies. It's the go-to book in terms of business storytelling uh, for how to, how to craft the story, how to tell the story, and lots of examples. It's like 365, it's like the encyclopedia of how to do it. And so that's available. Um, I'm also a TEDx speaker. <clears throat> I work with a lot of engineers and technology companies around storytelling and data storytelling. 
And I'm actually a pioneer in data storytelling. <clears throat> I've been doing storytelling in business long before it was popular. So I'm one of the originals in the field. And I saw the trend of data storytelling pop up on the horizon about six years ago. And ever since then, I've been developing methods and tools and processes and models for how to do really effective data storytelling. So these are some of the things that I want to share with you today. So the agenda, you see there is, I, there was an agenda slide. Where is that? There it is. Okay, sorry to go back and forth. I just want to make sure we let you know what we're going to cover today. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about what data storytelling is and is not. I, we're also going to talk about how to ensure people don't take action. This is the biggest mistake people make. And we're going to talk about that mistake and how to avoid that mistake so that people do take action based on the data stories you tell. And then we're actually going to dig in a little bit into how to do data storytelling. So that's our agenda for today. All right. So let's look at what data storytelling is and is not. Like, what the heck is a data story? So the first thing I want you to do, and you feel free to uh, use the chat box. And, and I like it when we interact uh, a bit with people. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to take a look at this data visualization. And I want you to tell me what insights you gain from just looking at this. Like what's your understanding here of this? What insights do you gain? Whoops, sorry. Seem to be going back and forth, sorry. My keys are not um, responding really well on my keyboard, so I apologize. All right, so what are some of the things? Let's see what we've got here. I'm looking to see if I can uh, see the chat box. There we go. So, it doesn't tell you a lot, absolutely. And I think uh, when you have to be creative in the, at the bottom, I think you have to have the creative in the bottom, right? You're punishing people, right? When you're showing something like this, right? So what I basically say about this data visualization is that it is a way for us to make sense of some data, right? Our reaction here is, oh yeah, I get it. That makes sense to me. I now understand how baby boomers, boomers describe themselves. But other than that, what are you learning or gaining from this? And really, what's the business value of knowing this information? Right? That, that's really the heart of the question. So most data visualizations are like this, however. They're a great way to help us make sense of the data, but not so great in terms of knowing what to do with the data. And so this is part of the issue we want to address today. Because data visualization is incredibly important, but it's not necessarily data storytelling. Although a lot of people call it data storytelling. It can be data storytelling. I have seen a few infographics that actually move from, oh, that makes sense, to, oh, now I know what to do. Now I have an insight. So then let's define what data storytelling is. It's moving from sense making to meaning making. You know, stories help us make meaning of the world. That's what's so valuable about storytelling. Data visualizations help make a sense of our data. And when we combine the two together, then that's when we have a real powerhouse. Data storytelling, in order to do it really well, requires us to use two types of thinking, insights thinking and story thinking, right? So let's dig into each of these. 
insights thinking is, well, what does it mean? And story thinking is, well, what is the story I can tell about this data and what it means so that it moves people to action? Insights thinking. All right, well, definitely artificial intelligence is all around us. It's fast coming up on the scene. It's already generating insights for us from vast you know, databases, which is really great. And yet, artificial intelligence is only providing insights to a certain level. And whether it is able to bring us insights that can actually disrupt a marketplace, we're not sure yet. We're still you know, learning all about that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit more in a minute. But basically, insights thinking is how to ask questions of the data so it actually brings business value. How do you tease value, business value, out of the data for either creating savings or efficiencies or to figure out brand new business models, new products, new services, market opportunities, if not outright disruptions in the marketplace. So how do we start thinking about insights and data? And there's this model here, I developed it uh, with um, a colleague of mine, Lori Silverman, to speak directly to data storytelling. And uh, this is a model for how data becomes valuable, basically. And knowing this model actually helps us think better about the data that we have. So, you know, data, we've got data, we gather, we find it. it, it just by doing that, it becomes information that we can manipulate and analyze. And that turns into knowledge because we identify factors and causes and we can say, all oh, right, this makes sense. And we get those kinds of insights. Oh yeah, this makes sense. And then if we start asking different questions of the data, questions that stimulate insights, then we move up into understanding, right? Where we can predict and prescribe, oh, that's how to improve what we already do. It's sort of like, oh yeah, this is what's happening today. Here's how we can fix problems today, right? So it's about current reality. And then if we ask different kinds of questions from the data, we can actually get insights that help transform the business. This is transformative business value. And our reaction is, oh, now I see a new business model, a new opportunity, a way to disrupt the marketplace. And the more we move up that, the pyramid here to understanding and transformation, the more human, human interaction is required. So we'll see if AI actually gets all the way up to providing transformative insights. Um, uh, but that's where human ingenuity and human thinking can really be leveraged to the maximum is when we get to those transformative insights. So I hope this starts making sense to you about how to think about data, how it moves up to um, and flows up to different kinds of insights, different kinds of useful uh, information. And if you have questions about this model, uh, then go ahead and put questions in the Q&A box. And if you take your mouse and you hover down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see this little Q&A area and you can type your questions in there. So that's insights thinking. And that's a framework for how to think about insights and how to relate to your data to generate different kinds of insights. Now let's talk about story thinking, which is how to share the data and insights as a story because that's the most powerful way to communicate new thoughts and ideas. And story thinking involves, yes, crafting the narrative. It's also putting it together with visuals and using data to help inform the visuals and help inform uh, the narrative. When you combine narrative and visuals together, that's really engaging and people really enjoy that. Data and visuals together help enlighten us. And when we bring data into narratives, it helps explain. It helps us explain uh, our observations of the world. 
So that is sort of in a nutshell what story thinking is. And when you combine story thinking with insights thinking, when you combine them together, that's when you've got like a maximum impact and maximum influence. So now let's talk about the number one mistake people make when they're dealing with uh, data storytelling so that you don't make the mistake and I'll talk about what to do instead. So the first mistake people make, and it's a very pervasive mistake, is thinking that people are persuaded by facts information and data. But I'll tell you, you know, no one ever marched on Washington because of charts, graphs, or bullet points, right? It just didn't happen. And you're not motivated by that. And yet we keep thinking that, oh yeah, if we just share facts and information and data, right, people will just get inspired and take action, but it, it doesn't happen. So what I wanna do is quickly go through the neuroscience of what happens to the brain when we just feed it facts and information and data. What you're doing when you just provide facts and information and data, it triggers the analytical brain. Now the analytical brain, when it's triggered, only activates two areas of the brain. The first area is Boca's brain, and the second area is Wernicke's area. And these are both the language centers of the brain. They're, the brain is made up of many different areas, but when your brain is on data, it only activates these two areas. And when you're in the analytical brain, this is what happens. This is our experience, is we get really focused on logic and reasoning. And what we pay attention to are facts and numbers. And that's about it. But you know, and I bet you've had this experience. Think of the last time you were in a meeting where a lot of data was shared right? All facts and numbers. Our experience, we all of a sudden, we start getting skeptical. Now, this is all shown, you know, through various brain scans and research that's been done over the years about the brain on data. We start turning skeptical. We go, is that data really true? Or is that all of the data? Or is there some piece that's missing? Right? So these questions lead us to desiring more information. That's what we want. And that last meeting you were in that was all about data and information. Remember what it was like and people saying, oh, but you know, we really can't make a decision because we need more data. We need more information, right? We want to know more. And the result is decisions get delayed and delayed and delayed because you're still collecting more information. The other thing that happens on the analytical brain is that it remains emotionally neutral. And what I'll show you when we get to the story brain, we'll see that stories get us emotionally engaged, which actually leads to decisions. But what the analytical brain does, it sort of leads to endless debates. And I'm sure you've had that experience when I do trainings and I ask participants about this. Yeah, everybody's hands up. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what happens in our meetings, right? So it's not really that effective. However, when we activate the story brain, we're going to talk about how to do that. When you activate the story brain, what happens is that the brain becomes immediately engaged in the experiences that you are sharing. It's very accepting. It's open, as opposed to kind of being closed and skeptical. The, there's another part of our brain that's activated when we're listening to stories, at least in the listener's brain, and that is everybody wants to know what is happening next, you know, what's going to happen next, and they all the brains, when they're listening to the story, that we're seeking resolution. We want to know how the story ends, and we want to know what it means. So we're our brains are driving towards that. We become emotionally engaged because this is what happens. The story, when you're, when you're sharing a story, it actually activates seven or more areas of the brain, including the sensory and motor areas. So that means that not only is storytelling a whole brain experience, because many more parts of the brain are engaged, but so is our physical body. So we call storytelling a whole body, whole brain 
activity. The other thing that happens when the brain is on story, this doesn't happen when your brain is on data. When your brain is on story, the storyteller and the story listener, their brains connect within one to two seconds. And the neuroscientists call this neural coupling, where the brains, two brains entrain together. And it only takes one to two seconds before that happens. So an immediate connection happens. When you're sharing a story, the listener becomes emotionally engaged. Well, so are you actually <laughs> telling the story. And that's a direct path to the limbic system. And the limbic system, the emotional brain, is where decisions are made. Tons of research that documents uh, that that's what happens. So it's obvious, right? Activating the storytelling brain, the story brain, is a good thing. Activating the analytical mind it's helpful, but only to a certain point. So that always leaves us with a question. Well, then, how do you merge and weave data and story together so that you provide the data that we all want and often need, but we don't uh, activate the analytical brain in its entirety, right? We stay in the story brain so everybody remains engaged and we then move to action by the end of the story. So, all this making sense so far, I hope. And here's a chart. You can just look at it when you, you know, get the recording of the webinar here. And it just shows the two together. So you can easily uh, see back and forth uh, how, what happens with the analytical brain and what happens with the story brain. So that leads us to the next question. Okay, so how do I do it, right? That's what, that, that's what we were just talking about. How do we weave data and story together for maximum impact? So I want to tell you that every story has a setting or a context. We have to provide the context. This is how we got to be in this place, or here I was sitting at the desk when my boss came up to me with this particular problem. So we have a setting or context, and then we have a problem, a challenge. And by the end of the story, that problem or challenge gets resolved. All stories have people in them, real life people, right? These are our characters. And what we know is that for maximum relatability, for maximum connection when you're telling the story, it's best to actually name people. Oh yeah, there was Joe on the team and Mary on the team, right? Or I was talking with Charlie uh, about what we could do and he had this brilliant idea. Right? So actually naming people, mm. it's very impactful. So all stories have people, all stories have action steps, right? We had a problem and then we took certain steps, we did certain things to help resolve that problem or meet that challenge. And then at the end, every story has a point. No point, no story. Right? I'm sure we've all had experiences. People have been sharing stories and we keep going, well, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? You know, to ourselves and our own mind. And it's because people are not clear about the point and they're searching for the point and the story goes on and on. So being clear about the point of the story, it's really important because it makes us more effective storytellers. So let's talk about two ways to think about weaving data and story together. Now, you know, there are hundreds of ways to tell the data story, but I'm going to give you two models to help you get started. So the first model is what I call the Oreo cookie model, where you start with the story, which is usually the problem in the context that we, this is what you share in the beginning. And then you slip in some data at the same time that you're talking about actions and insights. And then you end the story with the point and what it means. So the story, the beginning and the end, is sort of like the chocolate cookie uh, crust, right? In the Oreo cookie. And then the data is that soft, creamy center. So that's one way to think about data and data storytelling, particularly if you have 
uh, a short amount of time to share some data. And you want to make sure that it's impactful. Now, the second model is more like a journey. You take people on a journey. And this is great when you have to craft an entire presentation and weave data into the presentation. Now, most presentations today when I work with companies are very data-driven and you're lucky if you hear a story. So what we want to do is take our, the best of our story thinking and uh, use that to craft a story and slip data into it. So it starts with a problem. You can see that near the bottom of the photo. You add the context. You take actions. Actions again is you know, actually in, in each piece of this journey, you can add bits of data, right? Here's the problem, our development life cycle was um, out of whack, right? It was 30% uh, 30, 30 longer than most other companies. And you can share a little bit about the context of that. You can talk about the actions that you took, the data that you collected, the insights that you gained, the other actions that you took around that. You can share your ahas and insights. Again, share some more data. You can talk about what this means. And then you recommend the steps that you want people to take and you leave everybody with a key message. So you slip these data nuggets uh, in the story and you craft your presentation, the entire presentation along this sort of narrative structure. You can do that uh, when you're sharing insights about, oh, this is what's happening today and this is how we can improve what we're doing today. Or you can tell, you can use the same structure and tell the story of tomorrow. Oh, here are the opportunities that are happening. And here's how we can leverage these opportunities and use the same structure to do that. Let me check the chat box really quick to see uh, some of the thoughts. And the analytical, is the analytical brain the same as the left brain? Is the story the right brain? That's a great question. And what we know is that the left brain, right brain model is sort of a broken model. It's not an accurate reflection of reality. So it's best to look at the brain and the different areas that are lit up in different experiences. So the analytical brain, it's like it's not on the left, it's sort of couple, you know, those two areas of the brain and, and they're not necessarily uh, located on the left side, right? And the story brain is not all activated on the right side. So there are, uh, it crosses, you know, into different, um, different areas of the brain. So better way to think about it is um, uh, more holistically. All right, great. Oh, glad you like the data nuggets piece. Good. So let's continue to move on. Um, one technique to use when you are sharing data are metaphors, similes, analogies. And it's a way to make a complex idea very simple. And we know that when we're sharing data, it can sometimes feel so complex. So a little example here is, um, I have here is about blockchain. Now, blockchain is everywhere these days, but what exactly is it and how do we get our heads wrapped around it? And if you look online for explanations of blockchain, it sometimes gets very complex. So when we are kind of introducing this notion of blockchain, one of the best metaphors or analogies I've heard and a metaphor is something is something, an analogy is, or a simile is something is like something. So I could say blockchain is digital tracking for a famous painting. Now, let me share a little bit about that. Let's say you have a work of art, maybe a Rembrandt painting. The value of the Rembrandt painting 
depends on the chain of ownership that is documented. Who it was sold to, who inherited it, what years they owned it, what happened to the store, to that painting through time. You know, maybe the Nazis stole it and hid it for a bunch of years and then it reemerged. So this is provenance, right? The provenance of a painting. And it's tricky. It's really tricky. And if you have a break in the chain of ownership around a painting, then it becomes far less valuable. Now, blockchain is a way to digitally track, let's say, a piece of artwork. And to do it in such a way that the ownership is completely locked down, right? It is like absolutely certain. Imagine what blockchain could do for the entire art world. It would solve an enormous problem. Now, as we dig into blockchain, there's a lot more to know about it, but that sets the framework for us for how to think about it using a metaphor or a simile. And then we can use that metaphor or simile to explain other parts of what blockchain is. So that's just a simple example of how a metaphor or an analogy can really be helpful in making a complex idea fairly simple to understand. Okay, so let's go into some tips for effective storytelling. Well, the first one, let me see if these, yeah, is to reverse engineer the story. So what do I mean by that? That means, hey, once you know the insights that you have, and once you know the final point that you want to make uh, at the present, end of the presentation or at the end of the story, then you can reverse into the near the story. You get that main point, you get that final point, you get the insights, and then you can start looking at the beginning and crafting the beginning. Now, why is that important? It's because when you reverse engineer the story, it becomes very easy then to figure out all of the details that you need to include that drive you to the point that you're going to be making. So it's a great way to filter out extraneous details. And when you've got a short amount of time to tell the data story, reverse engineering the story from the end, figuring out what that key point is and the insights that you want to share and what you want people to do, makes it a lot easier then to know what to include in the beginning and the middle. Always tell a personal story. Right? It's about you and your team. It's about you and your boss. Right? It's about you and the company. Share a personal story. That creates maximum engagement between you and your audience. It makes the story become real and alive and authentic. And we live the experience. Most people, when they start out, particularly with data storytelling, it kind of goes like this. I went to the store, I bought some bread, I came home, made a sandwich, had lunch, and then went back to work. There's this piece of data, and then this piece of data, and then this piece of data, and then this piece of data, right? Well, are you gonna buy that story, right? Are, are you gonna go see that movie or buy that book? No, you're not, because it's just a series of events, right? Just A plus B plus C plus D, right? And then the end. It's not engaging, it's boring. So how do you avoid that? Well, you put yourself back into the experience. What were you doing when your boss approached you and said, hey, we've got a problem. We've got to fix this. We need to get some more data or figure out what the data says so we can solve this problem. What was going on? Where were you? How are you feeling? How is he feeling? Relive the experience of what happened initially, the steps you took. That's the best way to avoid I went to the store, I bought some bread, I came home and made a sandwich. Right? If you can relive the experience, your audience can be in the experience and that's where you get maximum engagement. So I hope that makes sense too. So again, story thinking, 
want to really talk a little bit more about this, particularly when it comes to visuals. Because data is supported by visuals and so is the narrative, particularly when we're doing data storytelling. Visuals and narrative, like sharing pictures or images when you're telling a story, sometimes you don't need it. But when you're doing and telling the data story, you absolutely need visuals. Of course, the, the easiest kind of visual that we end up uh, putting together for data stories are charts and graphs and bullet points. But I want to remind you that images and photographs of life, people, imagery that people can relate to other than data is really, really important because that helps them engage emotionally with what you're talking about. And often pictures with people are the most powerful. So remember that when you're putting your visuals together, add other kinds of images or images of real people into uh, what you are presenting. I see we have some more chats coming in. Okay, glad the audio is back. Okay, we're good to go. All right, so that's a little bit, another little tip in the story thinking uh, area. All right, so let's review. We talked about data storytelling, what it is and is not. Data visualization is often just about sense making. Data storytelling is about going to the next level and actually doing meaning making. And the two work well together, right? But a lot of data visualization, it's called data storytelling and I'm kind of going, mm, maybe not so much, right? That's okay, we can improve on it and actually bring story front and center. We want to definitely avoid this mistake, which is thinking that people are persuaded by charts and graphs and data and information. So again, I'll remind you, never, no one ever marched on Washington because of charts or graphs or bullet points, right? So avoid just activating the analytical mind and make sure you keep activating the story brain and you slip these data nuggets to in, right? So you are able to share your data, but not lose people and not put them to sleep. Oh, and by the way, did you know that when somebody is listening to a presentation that is a storied presentation, that 65% of the people remember the stories that they heard, but only 5% remember the data that was shared. So just think of that if you've got a data heavy presentation. Only 5% of your listeners are going to be able to remember anything about it. But if you craft it as a story and share it as a story, then that memorability goes up 65%, which is really what you want. Okay, so, and then also so we did how to tell the data story, right? And gave you some uh, tips, uh, some models, uh, some structures, you know, to look at. So how do you want to continue to build your storytelling skills, right? You, you came to this webinar because you wanted to know how to do the data and story thing together, how to weave that together. And storytelling takes practice, right? You, you, you we, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been involved in storytelling in business for about 20 years and I still take workshops on uh, storytelling because there's always something more to learn and to practice and get better at. So how to build your storytelling skills? Uh, well, I mentioned before my book, This is Storytelling for Dummies, is you know, the best primer out there for how to craft and tell your story. It's available on Amazon. I suggest going to get it there. I, it's uh, less expensive and you'll get it a lot faster than if you uh, asked me to mail you a book, right? So go grab that as sort of like your Bible uh, for business storytelling. There's even a section in there, a whole chapter on data storytelling. You can also sign up for my newsletter on my website, which is juststoryit.com. It's down at the bottom of the screen. All of these are hyperlinks also. And 
Every other week, I send out five bullet points on how to improve your storytelling and then links to a couple other uh, good articles. So you can go ahead and sign up for that. There's also training and coaching course that I do. And if you or your company wants to talk a little bit more about training or coaching, you know, it's like the, the kinds of training and coaching I do is how to craft the data story, how to do full presentations, weaving data and story together, and then also insights training, right? How do you grab those insights from the data I call, but my training for that is how to think like Einstein, right? And how to leverage human intelligence to get, grab those insights. I, and so if you're interested in talking to me about those things, you can um, contact me for a 30 minute, you know, free you know, story coaching session. And just email me here down at my email address for an application. And through your application, I'll be able to determine if I can help you or not. If I can't help you, I will refer you to somebody who I think can help you, right? So don't hesitate to contact me. All right, let me take a look at the chat really, really quick, quick before, before we move over, over to, to um, um, the uh, yeah. questions and answers. Um, and so thanks, Sean, for the plug on the book. That's great. And thank you, Melinda. I'm glad that uh, you really like the newsletter. I, I hope that it's proving uh, very helpful. Okay, good. So uh, let's continue on. And let's go for those questions. Let's see what people have in terms of questions. And if you think of more questions, as uh, so we're looking at the um, the ones that we have so far, then go ahead and type those in. All right, so let's see what we've got here. What is the hardest part of transforming data into an amazing visualization that people not only understand, but also that people enjoy? You know, I think the hardest part is figuring out the main point that you're trying to make, right? And that happens whether you're dealing with data or you're dealing with a story, which is why I, I really focus on reverse engineering and reverse engineering the story first. You really think about what you want to convey, either about the data you're sharing, uh, or what's the final thought you want to leave people with as you finish the story. And if you can figure that out, and everybody can, right? It happens all the time. Once you figure that out, then it's way easy to figure out what's the data I need to share to support that point, to support that final thought that I want to leave people with. So it, does that help? And you can continue to you know, ask a question, another question, if that is true. So Karen, I have a question. This is mm -hmm. Karen. Um, the, so first, I want to say that uh, the nugget you shared about 5% remember the data and, and the, the more the story, the, but they'll always remember the story. Uh -huh. I've actually been incorporating a small story at the front of my presentations that has nothing to do with my, my presentations. Uh -huh. And this is a true story, but I just had emailed a, a prospect that I was talking to and he'll out. And the first thing he said is I'll always remember that Island story you told. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's absolutely true. I, I, I believe it with my heart now that, uh, that the stuff works and the things that you've been saying make, make a lot of sense. Uh, I do have one question around, you know, you mentioned the information gap and I've been reading a lot about that. Mm. Do you have any tips for creating that gap? That's something that I have been struggling with a little bit. So are you talking about the gap between we've got a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of data and then we really don't know what to do with it. Well, no, no. I'm talking more about in the storytelling aspect. Mm. How do you then create that question in their mind, and keep the audience engaged, so that they say, you know, what happens next? Oh, right. Well, I think that really kicks in strongly when you present the problem, and then the action steps that you took to solve that problem. Now, what's really interesting is 
Solving that problem or meeting that challenge is very rarely a straight line. It's not like, oh, we had this problem, we took one action step, and we got our answer, woohoo, right? Mm -hmm. There's usually much more involved in it. And so you struggle some, somehow with the data. You got lost in the weeds of the data. You had meetings where you were really uh, struggling hard to figure out what the data meant. You came up some, with some different approaches for how to look at the data. You started, at, started to ask different questions. And lo and behold, oh my gosh, right? We had this amazing aha moment and knew exactly what we needed to do. So when you share a story like that, it keeps people on the edge of their seat. And that part of the brain is automatically activated that is wanting to know what's coming next, what's coming next. So I think I took from that then it, it, to your point is relive the experience mm -hmm. of going mm -hmm. to more detail on, on that reliving aspect. That's very true, Carrie. Uh, otherwise, you just end up with a series of events that's not engaging that will just sort of put people to sleep. So there's one other point that you made, Carrie, that I want to emphasize is that when it it was the reaction you shared of people who said, oh, I remember that story. That's so critical to realize because what I want to say is that stories travel. And if you share stories in your presentation and if you're trying to influence people to take action, then their ability to stand up and leave the meeting and later in the day, with somebody that wasn't even in the meeting, they're able to share that story and uh, uh, what your ideas are and recommendations are, uh, then you have just influenced more than just the people in the room, right? And, and that's how decisions are made with, uh, often uh, uh, collectively, right? When we test things out with other people and we get their input and, and what have you. So stories travel, and that's a really good thing, and most people don't recognize that. Uh, and so I, I, I wanted to bring that front and center uh, for people's awareness. Excellent. Well, I know we're, we're at the, the time, so again, uh, if anybody has any last second questions, um, chime in now. Otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap that. And again, Karen, thank you so, so much for, for um, providing your time and these tips for us to, to better ourselves. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Carrie. It was my delight. I hope people walked away with some good tips, tools, uh, ways to think about data storytelling so that you have more confidence uh, when you're back in the office and, and know more about what to do. So uh, you're welcome and have a great day, everybody. Right. Have a great one, everyone. Bye.